you can improve your success rate because you're dropping out the things that you're not able to do. And if you can prioritize your work that way, you, you get to a point where you can just say, you know what, for the stuff that I can do, this is at 95, 96% accuracy now. Now let's like lower the gates, let some other tasks in, and again, build more opinionated capabilities. Like what we're not saying is we can do everything. What we're saying is we can do seven things and let's go figure out what the eighth thing is, what the ninth thing is. Welcome to season two of Building with AI, the show where we engage in conversations with world-class AI product builders and leaders. We help uncover tactical insights to help you build and scale better AI products. I'm your host, Haroon Chaudhry, and today we're joined by Jason Liu, a seasoned AI operator and consultant who advises seed stage startups on tech strategy, research, and infrastructure. During the episode, Jason discusses the role of dev tooling in non-deterministic code, challenges around evaluating AI systems, the future of AI in business, and much more. But before we dig in, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Autoblocks, the AI optimization platform product teams use to create world-class AI experiences. So you just launched V0 of your AI feature product. What's next? Autoblocks unlocks an intuitive yet powerful optimization workflow that helps you continuously understand, improve, differentiate your AI powered products. Understand how your users interact with your product by connecting user activity to what's happening under the hood of your application. Improve your product thoughtfully and iteratively. Integrate testing of your AI products into your CI workflow and run A-B tests to see what changes are driving great user outcomes. Differentiate your AI products with powerful fine-tuning workflow that lets you turn product usage data into training data. Get started with Autoblocks for free at autoblocks.ai now. Back to the episode. Jason, welcome to the show. Thank you. So for anybody who doesn't know you, who doesn't follow you on Twitter, can you give a quick intro on who you are and the projects you're working on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I spent the past eight years doing machine learning and slowly transitioning to building more dev tools. And I told myself I would take last year off and enjoy some vacation time. But as the LLM wave really came back, I was too excited to not really try out and, and understand more about what's going on. These days, I spend half my time doing applied AI consulting, working with like C-Stage and Series A startups, figuring out their AI strategies. And then the other half, I spend contributing to open source. So my libraries like Instructure and Fast LLM to do things like hosting LLMs and doing better inference. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the open source work that you're doing? Obviously, you're doing a lot of great work there, but keen for you to share a little bit more about it. The general idea is that I wrote this library called Instructor in Python. And the premise was that I want to be able to integrate with Pydantic's internal validation. And by doing that, what it allows us to do is we can write Python code and use the Python code itself to prompt a language model. We've had the idea of having structs and having functions for a very long time in every single language. And so in Python, we can use Pydantic to communicate with the language model, verify that the objects are correct, and then what you get back out from the language model is just a Python object. And then moving forward, we've done the same thing for Elixir now and also in JavaScript with Zod. And so the goal now is to sort of provide this utility for every language and you know, make sure that we're integrated with the existing validation code. And so there's a very thin layer of abstraction between the language model and the programming languages, structs and validation classes. Got it. And to zoom out, why is this important in the grand scheme of building AI applications? I think the trick here is that we call them AI applications, but they're really just normal applications. We have placed too much magic and too much priority over the AI aspect and not necessarily enough emphasis on just general code quality. I don't really differentiate between an app that I've built versus an app that I built for a website or an app that's backed by a database. And if we can bring all of AI to be as simplified and as reduced as something as like what server I run on or what kind of backend I use or what ORM I use, then we can, again, sort of reason about everything as if it's just writing regular code. The idea with using something like Pydantic or Zod, what I get back out is just an object. And the object may have methods. I can ensure that the name is an integer. So the name is a string or the age is an integer. And I can go just carry on my day and, and write code as if there was no AI behind the scenes. So would it be a correct description to say that it helps create more determinism in the process of incorporating generative AI into your code base? Exactly. And not only do you get more determinism as a system, because it's integrated with something like Zod or Pydantic, 
It improves like how we think about the IDE. It improves how we think about saving this data to a database using an ORM. We get all the tools we have built for the past 10 years, 20 years that are free. Perfect. Yeah. And we were chatting just a couple of weeks ago in our office. You mentioned a few really apt analogies that still have stuck in my brain about the different types of tooling that we have available. You have things that you described that are like slap shop type tools. And then you have certain tools that are a little bit more like a chef's knife. So Instructor being a tool in this vast ecosystem of developer tools for helping companies build with non-deterministic parts of their code, how do you describe those two different categories of tools and why one of them might be more useful? I think a lot of the questions I had during the summer was, okay, what's the roadmap for Instructor? Are you going to start a company? You're going to build a framework around this? And for the most part, my response was no. My goal really is to make a nice little knife, teach people to how to like cut their carrots, right? Teach you some knife skills. And then you can bring the, that knife to the kitchen. You can use that to cook for your friends. But the general idea is that it's the skills that I want to teach you. It's not the tool itself. Pydantic is supported in things like Marvin. It is supported in Langton and Llama Index. Whether or not you use my library doesn't really matter. The idea is that we can actually, again, develop this backwards compatibility by thinking about integrating the language model with existing structs and objects. And so whether or not you use Instructor or Langchain, you still benefit from the lessons I'm teaching, the documentation I'm writing. And that's kind of my goal. There's other tools that are very specific where there's kind of like a limit to how much you can use a slap chop. At some point, you graduate out of that kind of complexity, whereas good knife skills can take you anywhere. You're trading off functionality and the long tail of use cases for a simpler experience. Now, in this world of Gen AI powered products where you have folks referencing LLM providers like OpenAI in their code base, we've obviously seen a lot of hype in this industry. We've seen a lot of folks who are traditionally non-technical express interest in getting involved here. I've seen product managers more involved in what's happening at the logging level than I've ever seen before in this new world. And so would you say that there's something there to potentially make the appeal of a slap chop type tool that's a little bit easier to use, more palatable, given that maybe less technical users are getting more involved at lower levels of this building workflow? I think so, right? Like whatever gets you in the kitchen is kind of the joke there, right? I think as long as we can make it more accessible, lower the skill gap, one day you're going to get a watermelon, you're going to cut that in half, you know, like you learn to, to use some other tools. As long as you get in the kitchen in this example, right? You learn to cook and sort of like you know, enjoy the act of cooking. That's kind of the analogy I really think about here. Just solving it as like a funnel problem. Because at some point in the future, you know, we might not need instructor, but you're still thinking about how to write prompts. You're still thinking about writing good code. If you don't use AI, good runtime validation is still useful for any code base. And again, it's the skills that we're taking along the way, not the tools themselves. And sort of building off of that analogy, I know you mentioned something along the lines of how many Michelin star restaurants have a slap chop. And I think that sort of hints at the <laughs> fact that maybe part of this is also on a spectrum of sophistication. Maybe it's something that's a little bit more useful when you're getting into the kitchen, but as you progress, as you develop, yeah. as you worry more about best practices and effective scalability than... I think so, right? Especially, you know, as you get into a more complex kitchen or a more complex product, the requirements are very dramatic. Like how do you get to control the tools you use become even more specific. And we might get to a point where even something like Instructor isn't enough because I have to use something like outlines where I want to do constrained sampling of my outputs rather than just asking for a JSON object. But the general idea, again, is like really the skill is learning how to think. That's very well said. How now you're obviously very plugged into the dev tooling community and the open source community building helpful tooling in this space. For folks who are relatively new to the space and who are still trying to wrap their heads around what differences, nuances, new considerations there might be when working with LLM providers, how do you think about the nuances of building dev tooling for non deterministic code versus traditional code? The big one is just getting intuition that these models are very different. And for the most part, I've actually been hesitant to support many language models behind the scenes because I know that the prompts I write will be very different for every single language model. And so I think a, a big important thing to do as a developer is just to spend a lot of time, right? Mistral and Mixtral do not behave the same way as GPT-3. If you want to get the same performance, you have to change your prompts. And you can only do that by just spending a lot of time and, and talking with these things. In the same way as a data scientist, it's just good to look at all the data that you're collecting, right? 
We can do statistics and averages and use evals. But if you just look at a thousand examples, you will have a much better understanding of the system than anybody else. Is that part of the challenge of doing evals in the space? I mean, evals is something that it's essentially scaling the interpretation of outputs from these models. But is that part of the difficulty? Is that there's this qualitative element that is sometimes very difficult to capture that is really only captured when you're looking through manually and doing what folks call manual evals? I would say for the most part, I think of evals as just some kind of scoring mechanism. And for the case of like OpenAI, they have evals because they want to know that their language model is not regressing in some capability. But they also write these evals because they need to have very generic capabilities, right? Like one of the evals I was looking at a couple of days ago was whether or not it could predict in a contiguous block of Korean words. If GPT-4 can do a better job of doing that, it also means that it has been able to understand language. But as a result, maybe it's underperforming on evals about writing code or writing prose. The difference though is that for a business, the evals is a proxy for an actual business outcome. Whereas in academia, an eval is a mechanism you use that like determines whether or not you publish a paper. And I don't want people to be confused from one or the other. There are many times at Facebook, for example, where you train an ad model and the ad model could predict clicks 1% better. But when you deploy that model, the business outcome does not change. There are other models that might perform the same, but maybe are... 20% faster, and then you launch that model and you make 2% more revenue. And so as much as evals are important because it's good to measure something in order to manage it, and for a business, I don't think that often is the eval, right? It's like revenue, it's churn, it's something else entirely. Wow. What I'm hearing from you is very much seeing the forest rather than the trees, right? If you're getting so caught up on maximizing, optimizing evals, you may lose a bigger picture of what's actually important for your business. And I think that's a very important lesson. Now, you mentioned that you're doing consulting work as well. Is this something that you're seeing across different engagements as well? Is that there's maybe a tendency for companies to get too caught up in the wrong thing? Yeah, like when I look at a lot of LLM ops companies, the examples of evals they pick are like, oh, are you apologizing too much? Or are you like mentioning the competitor? Or how terse are you? But really those things are, are in service of a business outcome. And I think one of the things I've been trying to push a lot of people to do is to tie these evals to some business outcome because we might believe that terseness is good, but it might just be the case that when something is shorter, it takes us time and the latency is actually the important thing. And maybe what you realize is that the time to first token is more important than the, at the time of the answer and you just have a shorter prompt or you use function calls or you use JSON mode because it's higher latency. There's so many other levers that you can play with in order to get a better business outcome. Whereas maybe the evals don't change, right? Maybe you use a dumber model, but it's faster and that's actually more important. And being really quantitative and understanding the relationship between the model, the success metrics, and then the business outcomes. I think something that people are not really focusing too much on. Another thing I've noticed is a lot of the people who are switching into this AI engineering role are like very skilled engineers but they don't have the background of, say, an analyst or like a data scientist to actually figure out what is the important problem to be solving. And that's also sort of coaching that I'm doing as part of my consulting. That's super interesting. And do you have any frameworks for helping companies think through that? Because I imagine that in the initial stages of exploring how a company can best utilize this technology in their product, there's very naturally a tendency for them to want to focus on looking at stuff that is very clear and easy to interpret instead of maybe finding that correlation between the performance of the, the AI integration with business outcomes. But do you have a framework for helping companies to ground the day-to-day -day testing evals that they're doing with those business outcomes? I would say the first one is to just make sure that your testing loop is very tight. You want to be able to make a change in your system and then do some evaluation right away in like the next three or four minutes to understand directionally if something is improving. The second aspect is to just understand that logging all this data is very important. Because we get a language model up front, we skip the infrastructure work it took to build the model, collect the data to then improve the model. And so when you collect that data, you're going to be able to relate that back to something like the business outcome, right? It's like, Okay, given these prompt and given this machine learning model, what is the average order value? What is the likelihood they come back in seven days? What is the time it takes for them to check out? We forget to track those things because they're so focused on the language model saying the right thing. Am I worried about hallucinations? Measurement is the second part. And then the third part is once you have this measurement data, 
just looking at the data. I think people really need to just, you know, for like a RAG application, for example, just look at the top 10 question results by some eval. Look at the bottom 10. Does it make sense? Let's look at the next 100 questions, next 1,000 questions, do some clustering. Are there like themes and topics that could be useful? Not only themes and topics, but styles of questions that are asking. Are these questions comparing topics? Are these questions related to the timeline or the relative time between topics? And then using the information to, again, go back and improve that system, whether it's realizing people are using last six weeks or latest news, and we should be able to build something that can use a time query much more specifically. Whereas if it's a compare and contrast question, maybe we should allow for parallel search queries to then synthesize a compare answer. But it all comes down to just measuring things and just looking at the data constantly. Wow. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And and so when you're measuring these things, what you're saying is that you'll be able to eventually correlate them with business outcomes. You'll be able to take that step back, look at it from a 10,000 foot view and essentially look at the different business drivers, percent checkouts, conversions, and then correspond them to different parts or different experiments that you've run with your model. Yeah. I mean, there's so many blog posts out there that just say, you know, like we are an e-commerce business and our revenue went up 1%. So let's get that out of the way first and then go work on your prompts and work on your evals. And maybe they're different teams and they have different objectives. But ultimately, as a business, you really have like a couple of objectives, retain talent and make some money. Would you say that the degrees of freedom that you're operating with when you're running experiments in this world is maybe different than with traditional software? Just given that obviously you have the model that you're using, you're, you have the prompt, you have the context you're feeding into the prompt, and then the combination of those things, the interaction between those things can oftentimes lead to surprising results as well. Would you say that it's different than experimentation with traditional code in terms of degrees of freedom and just complexity? Yeah, I definitely agree. I would say the response to that then is, well, just, we just have to start like regularizing the problem. Like usually if there's too many degrees of freedom, you regularize. When we first came out with a bunch of AI agents, we had to believe that they could do anything, right? And when you do that, you can do anything. And then your eval suggests that you will succeed on your task like 45% of the time. But if you just decided to sort of look again, look at the data and figure out that, okay, for some portion of these tasks, we don't do well in, let's go drop those weights to zero. When you start asking me questions about like A, B, or C, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you that I can't do this well. And then maybe suggest an alternative. Like, oh, I can't send the email for you. Let me draft the email, right? I can't make this task. I can't prepare this information. Let me like do a Google search and present some information back to you. Just by doing that, you can improve your success rate because you're dropping out the things that you're not able to do. And if you can prioritize your work that way, you, you get to a point where you can just say, you know what, for the stuff that I can do, this is at 95, 96% accuracy now. Now let's like lower the gates, let some other tasks in, and again, build more opinionated capabilities. Like what we're not saying is we can do everything. What we're saying is we can do seven things and let's go figure out what the eighth thing is, what is the ninth thing is. And then again, like, slowly open the floodgates in terms of these capabilities and just regularize the problem we're trying to solve. So how does that play in with just the rapid progression of the space and the new technologies and techniques and, and, and the research coming out? There's definitely a shiny object syndrome across the board here where there's just so much coming at consumers that either they're paralyzed and they're saying, all right, I'm going to wait for the dust to settle mm -hmm. and 2030 or something or whatever, and then figure out our AI strategy then, or they're trying the latest things and they're modifying their code base very regularly and obviously creating a lot of overhead and technical debt as a result. How do you think about dealing with the progression in the space and still maintaining that incremental and more level-headed approach to building out some of these features so that they're actually performing well? The way that I've tried to address with, the, with my library with instructor is the fact that I want to write code that is very easy to delete. And not only is it easy, easy to delete, there's not very many levels of abstraction. Like if you take a function that uses instructor and you go into VS Code and you command click any function, you'll go immediately to the standard library. All we do is we give you a couple of keyword arguments into the OpenAI SDK. And so when you want to change something, when, when you want to delete something, there's not much you have to keep in your head. All you have to focus on is what is the function and what is the type of the response object you're going to get. And once you get back there, it's just regular code. And by having a light framework and by having something that's easy to delete, it's very easy to do experimentation because everything fits in your head. When something needs to change, 
you know what needs to change. I think some of these frameworks really have gone a little bit too complicated. And so when something new comes out, not only is it hard to delete, to add a new feature, you had to touch so much of that code base that uh, again, you end up iterating much slower. Yeah, I was just thinking about these frameworks when you're mentioning that because I, I see that agility as being a competitive advantage in this industry. As a company, it's important to steer away from anything that's going to introduce more dependencies that may backfire later on. And so when you think about these frameworks, obviously a lot of them have seen tremendous success. They've simplified a lot of parts of the development process. But how would you encourage companies or how do you encourage companies that you're consulting to think about these frameworks when they're building AI-powered features? I would say a lot of it is just pick the tools that have great documentation. Things are moving so quickly, understands when something new comes out, you want to break the code for that and, and, and show that it, this exists. But on the other hand, for a company, you have to pick code that is like somewhat reliable and somewhat stable. And, you know, having document that's update means that they actually have the bandwidth to maintain things that they've built rather than always chasing after that, that shiny object. The other thing too is when you see code that does a lot of work for you up front, what you're doing is you're borrowing time in the future. If you're able to do something that takes 400 lines of code in 20 minutes with six lines of code, what this really means is six months from now, when you want to change that code, one line of code has to impact a large network of internal complexity. And what we found is with, with a lot of our clients, we end up going off of these frameworks primarily because we need to make three or four changes that are very important to the business because they capture some kind of business logic that doesn't fit the model of any of these frameworks. For the most part, I've seen a lot of folks just roll their own infrastructure. And you know, a lot of the time, you're only really replacing like maybe a thousand lines of code. Instead of taking out one day, taking a week to build something out might mean that six months in the future. Very interesting. And the folks that you're consulting and that you're working with, what are some of the common things that you're seeing across the board? What are the patterns, the trends that you're seeing in companies that are obviously thinking a lot about generative AI and how it applies to their business? Yeah, I would say the big one is focusing on something like chatbots, whether that's like a conversion or a lead Whatever that is, building tools that allow you to take some kind of like conversion or like conversion event. The second thing I've really noticed is people really drawing, pulling away from agents. I think they were very sexy maybe during the summer of last year, but then have more users. They're realizing that the churn is a huge problem. For every AI product, you, I'm sure people have shown this MMR plot where it just goes hockey stick, right? But what they don't show you is right afterwards, that just like falls back down. And a lot of the business is basically making sure that slope is as flat as possible. Yeah, I've heard somebody refer to the users who are jumping between different AI products just to explore them, just to try them out as AI yeah. tourists. And I know a lot of businesses that have benefited from them. I'm curious for the folks that you've seen that have been able to prevent that just very steep fall off or at least manage it in the best possible way. What are some of the things that have lended to successfully managing it? I would say there are three things. There's education, engagements, and quality. And so education is the fact that for the most part, because these AI models can do anything, we don't really know what to ask it. Because we don't know what the superpowers are, you might download something, you try it out, but then you might not really be sure when you'll ever want to use this again. It's very obvious for something like a transcript, you know, AI will obviously after every meeting, I might use the transcript, but when you're given a blank search bar, when you're given a blank chat box, it's really hard to figure out what to do. And so education helps you get those capabilities to the user using this feature that we have, try asking it about your emails, et cetera, et cetera. And then when it comes to actual minimizing something like churn, the idea is to minimize churn, you really want to maximize like some kind of time spent metric, some engagement metric. If I have to go to the chat bot, for example, to engage with it, if I forget because I don't have any good ideas, my utilization will go down. What that might look like to improve engagements is just having a little bit more pop-ups, figuring out when is the right time to send a notification, having some kind of push engagement with the user rather than just waiting for the user to message the agent. And the second thing is just quality. Output is the work times the leverage. The work is basically sort of the volume times the leverage. The volume is like how often we're engaging, how often we're sending in a push notification, how often we're trying to educate the user. And the leverage is just quality and those are the things that you build evals against and you try to set those against the business metrics. A lot of this sounds like the best practices for just building products, not even AI powered products, right? I mean, there's some nuances and you mentioned evaluations and whatnot, but a lot of the principles you mentioned are seem fairly generalizable. Now, is that how you see it? That building great gen AI powered products is very similar to building great products that are maybe not gen AI powered? Yeah, for the most part, like I've only ever built products that are probabilistic, right? I've only ever built products that are backed by some machine learning model. 
where there's uncertainties and there's a very stochastic failure modes. One of the theses I have is I personally think all of retrieval augmented generation is just a recommendation system. If you look at the business model of my previous employer, Stitch Fix, and what a rag system does, it's very similar. At Stitch Fix, the customer says, I'm going to the beach and, and go to a wedding. Like, what should I wear? And Stitch Fix will take that request, turn it into many search queries, find inventory, and then show the inventory to a stylist. Then we teach the stylist to figure out what clothing to put in the box based on the note. And then we, we create a collection, we write a note, and then we send it off to the user. This is the same thing as rag. I ask a question. The language model prepares that question and makes a bunch of search queries. The inventory instead of clothing is just a bunch of paragraphs of text. And instead of a stylus, they have a separate language model that synthesizes the answer. And now if we bring back this recommendation framework, what we realize are important is just capturing feedback, understanding whether or not the local scores actually impact the final score. Like every stylist sees the probability a user might buy a piece of clothing. That would be an eval. But the actual outcome I want is to maximize order value. I want to maximize how many shipments you get in a year. I want to make sure that you don't get too many shipments and your closet fills up. Whatever that is, that is just general data science and product sense. Now, effective RAG is something that we've been hearing about a lot. I would say the mentions of what it takes to build effective RAG have been increasing pretty dramatically in Q4 2023. And so you made the comparison between RAG and recommendation systems. Part of what makes a successful RAG system is the ability to properly load up the data in a way that's best queryable by whatever engine that you have. Do you have any ideas or suggestions for best practices for that step in the RAG process? or maybe even RAG in general, what are some of the things that you think about that make a successful or effective RAG system? My money is on the fact that all this RAG work is effectively just a recommendation system. And the only thing people should focus on is instead of building search, just build a recommendation system. And the difference is that the recommendation system should improve over time as it makes recommendations. And RAG systems right now do not. We get a piece of text and we embed it with OpenAI and it's there forever. There's no additional change. No matter how many times it's being used by that language model, no matter how many times it is important to answer a question, we don't improve that. Imagine a world where someone watches a movie on Netflix. The recommendation for that movie does not improve. You know, imagine a system where your zip code, your, your address does not change the recommendation systems. Imagine a world where your age or whatnot does not change the recommendations you get, right? That would just be terrible. And so I think a lot of the best practices is really acknowledging the fact that this is a recommendation system and thinking hard about what kind of features you would need to improve that. And the easiest one you would build is an embedding. At Stitch Fix, building an embedding search model is kind of like the intern project you would give somebody. And then the real question is, how do you update it over time? When someone buys something versus someone, someone clicks something versus someone add into cart, it's all feedback, but the, the purchase feedback is way more important than the click feedback. How do you incorporate that in the model? When you have a piece of clothing that has never been purchased before, how do we have a good estimate of what the embedding should be and how does it change over time? Does seasonality play an effect? Your zip code versus the weather, these are all things that can determine whether or not you buy a piece of clothing. Why is it the case that if I use like a chatbot for the next two, three years, we can use all the tools we've ever built and recommendation systems and information retrieval. That goes all the way back to like the 70s. Wow, that is super, super interesting. And for companies that are experimenting with improvements to their RAG, what are some ways that they can measure if the changes are actually lending to improvements or if they're not lending to improvements? Experiments over a few test runs or is there maybe a more robust way of iterating on this? The goal is you always want some like local short-term metrics. So an example could be if I do have a data set of questions and good answers and good text chunks. I want to make sure that when I retrain my embedding model, like AUC goes up, accuracy and recall goes up. That's something where I can, if I make a change today, by the end of the day, I know what that metric looks like. Then there might be more complex evals where I make the language model generate the entire answer. And then I ask another language model, like, okay, like, this is the question, this is the answer, is it good or not? That might take a couple hours to run. But then ultimately, again, you're optimizing for some business outcome. And so at the end of the day, you just want an A-B test. Maybe you have different embedding models, you have different prompts, you can always A-B test some of these results and understand what exactly is changing in the business. Yeah, and so you mentioned the Stitch Fix example. And in that case, where my mind goes is when the recommendation system is pulling from the database of inventory in order to make the recommendation, it seems a lot more straightforward than when you have unstructured text that's stored in a vector database and 
you're looking to query the best and most relevant examples, chunks of that unstructured data. And obviously that's contingent on building the best chunking strategy there. Like how do you want to take that unstructured data and how do you want to add the relevant metadata to it and what sort of chunk size you want to work with. So in regards to that part of the process, let's call it data pre-processing, data loading. What are some best practices that you might recommend for companies that want to make this a little bit more analogous to a traditional recommendation system that's on structured data? My recommendation here would mostly be around just watching domain experts do similar tasks and trying to figure out what are the assumptions when they make these decisions. For example, imagine a world where at day one, all I have for Stitch Fix is the description of a piece of clothing and the photo. And so I can say, well, I have a multimodal embedding and I hope over time my multimodal embedding can learn things like what's good for hot and cold weather. Or what you might figure out is, like, oh, you know, when someone says they're going to Miami, our, our human stylists never send like a winter jacket. What is that actually capturing? Well, there's capturing this idea of like climate being a feature of the client and then like the warmth being a feature of the inventory. And we should figure that out, whatever that means. And then you can go and you, maybe you say, you know what, this is important enough where if we did this well, we'll make a million dollars. So we're willing to spend $10,000 and relabel everything. We can ask you before we can do whatever we need to do to get this data. Maybe we go to the merchandiser and say, you have to tell us the weight of the fabric and you have to tell us the material of that fabric. And now we have two other features that we can put into our model. You can imagine for every financial report, you might want the list of all mentioned stock tickers. You might want to understand at the time of this report was published, the value of the stock. You may maybe you want to know like the PE ratio. Maybe this is data that's important for your retrieval process. Maybe you want to realize that certain dates are happening, or maybe you want to know it was in the fiscal year 2024, and that's actually December 2023, and you want to resolve some date times because one day you want people want to ask questions with recency queries, right? All this comes back down to just talking to experts and like thinking hard about what are the assumptions you can make that make this problem simpler. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And it also underlines the importance of logging your data because the better understanding you have of the questions that folks are asking, the more intuition you might have as to the different ways that your product is being used so that you can incorporate that into your RAG decisions. I think for every company, one of the first things I do is I just build a dashboard that says, okay, given your RAG system, we use Cohere to do some re-ranking. For every question, I want you to mark the average Cohere scores. And every day when we wake up, we're going to look at the worst 100 questions and just figure out why they're so bad. And maybe what we realize is, oh, Cohere cannot correctly capture some questions because maybe there's something else. Maybe you go and we realize, oh, everyone's asking about who owns a certain document. And that is not available in the text chunk, obviously. But because there's so many questions, maybe we start attaching like published by, modified by, created by. Maybe we want to add the org ID of the user ID and then give the language model a tool to like take a user ID and resolve that to a, an owner or a team, right? This only comes out because you're just looking at the data, unless you knew this ahead of time by asking a domain expert. All right. So Jason, I'm curious as being somebody that's in the center of this community that's very plugged into what's happening. What are some of the things that you're most excited about in the developer community for generative AI? I think the biggest one right now is being able to convert all the data that you collect into data that you can use to improve your models. Right now, I think many people use GPT-4, GPT-3.5. Some are fine-tuning 3.5. But in that same regard, I don't think many people are fine-tuning their own embedding models with user data, right? We've spoke this many times during the podcast. And so having personalized RAG. And what that really is just is just regular recommendation systems. When I ask the question, maybe they know something about me and they can use different embeddings. You can imagine, for example, a company like Notion, every workspace can use different embeddings because maybe one client is using all medical terminology, another is using lawyer, like legal terminology. It might make sense that you use different embeddings to fine tune that data. And it would make even more sense if that fine tune was a consequence of your own users. And what this means is that there are now network effects when like there are more users in your platform can actually make your retrieval better. Your rag is better because you have a thousand users on the platform. I think that's the point where we're going to get to in the coming months. That's pretty mind-blowing. It seems like there's got to be some startups or folks working on this right now. Do you know of anything that comes to mind? I know there are companies working on better embeddings, but they're always better in a general public benchmark. But what we've seen in practice is even with 10,000 questions or even with 5,000 questions of your own personal data, you will dramatically outperform any like hugging face embedding model. The moment you have data, you can do a lot better. And when it comes to data, even with 5,000 examples, you can go from like 70% recall to like 85. And if you're a big company with actual users, 5,000 questions is something you should be able to generate in a couple of hours. 
So now I can imagine a world where you have months of data over time. It just gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. And, and for companies that want to keep up with these types of developments and they want to be able to action on, let's say, this new generation RAG or vector database company that's able to help you create this more personalized RAG, what's the best way for them to future-proof themselves? The answer might be logging again, but I'm curious like, what your thoughts are on future-proofing. Yeah, I mean, if it's future-proofing, I just think you should just save all your data in a text file. As long as you have the data, the model doesn't really matter. No one really future-proofed the data on the internet, but that is still the data we're going to use to train our language models. The model will change, but the data will stay the same. Amazing. Okay, so what I like to ask all the guests on the show is their hottest take. So specifically related to AI, something that you are adamant about, you would die in a hill for, but most people would disagree with you. You mentioned a couple of things that are probably contrarian takes, but <laughs> I'm curious if you have one that's just like, all right, this is the one thing that comes to mind as my hottest take. I would say the biggest one really is the fact that I just don't think LLMs need are like an elevated class of programming. If you hear me comparing language model technology, I usually think of it as the same as well. Some people want to own their own data center. Many people don't own their own data centers, but everyone uses a database. When they call other startups like OpenAI wrapper, it's like, well, a lot of companies just wrap a database with a UI. So I don't see much of a difference between these two. Instructor is kind of the ORM to a language model. And then everyone else uses an ORM to a database. It's quite reductive, but by doing that, everything becomes tractable. Yeah. And people are able to get their head out of the clouds, it seems like. Exactly, exactly. Awesome. Well, is there anything you're working on, Jason, that you want to share with the audience? Anything that they can keep an eye out for? If you guys want to keep up with some of the stuff that I've been working on, check out the Instructor blog. I'm sure there'll be like a link somewhere in the description. And on top of that, we're also trying to build Instructor out for a bunch of different languages. So we have Elixir out. We're working on getting the JavaScript one out. If anyone's interested in contributing to that or even maybe building out a Ruby one that connects with Ruby on Rails, hit me up on Twitter and then we can uh, get some work done. And where can people find you? So you mentioned Twitter, anywhere else, and also what's your Twitter handle? JXNLCO. Love it. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you, man. Take care.